So in the last two weeks, I've had several situations come up that have been where someone calls and they say, I'm in the emergency room. I am really needing your help or I need, can you come here? It's a situation that I know exists, but there's just been so many of them the last two weeks. And so I'm going to uh, talk about the fear of death. Sometimes it's the fear of dying itself, but it all centers around fearing death. And so there is a lot of legitimacy to being afraid of death for certain people. That should be a very valid concern. But for those who are in Christ, it's caught somewhere in an untruth. Because if the truth were known about that, whole situation, they would realize that there is absolutely nothing to fear. That is the ultimate, that will be the ultimate moment of our lives is what most people consider the point of death. So, but in reality, there are several different types of death spoken of in uh, the context of God. There are it's a, it's a more intense subject than what people think of as dying in this life. So I just want to cover the subject of death and who should be concerned and who should not be concerned, but just to cover the truth about death. Um, it's kind of hard to hear when there's Christians just paralyzed with this fear of death, having panic attacks, ending up in the hospital, because that should not happen when it's Christian. So I'm hoping to resolve that too. The publication, the Medical News Today, they report that there's an actual diagnosis called thanatophobia. I'm not positive on the exact pronunciation, but it's T-H-A-N-A-T-O, phobia, which is an intense fear of death or dying. And for some, this involves the fear of being dead, the fear of dying, the process of dying, or even the fear of death of someone that, that they love. And there's usually very specific symptoms present in someone who has a typical fear of death, which will qualify as this specific phobia. They have excessive worry or fear of death or dying, and it gets in the way of their life, and they actively work to avoid situations that involve death or dying, and they experience intense anxiety when encountering or thinking about death or dying. And this will produce the following symptoms, sweating, shortness of breath, a racing heart, nausea, headache, fatigue, insomnia, and this is a form of anxiety that's characterized by a fear of one's own death. And that is commonly called death anxiety, which is what that word actually means when it's broken down. Death anxiety is not defined as a distinct disorder, but it may be linked to depression and other anxiety disorders, which include PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, panic disorders, panic attacks, anxiety disorders, and almost a hypochondria type disorder for many. And this can also be caused by other fears, which include or could include fear of losing control. It's natural for humans to fear what they don't know. And this fear can carry over into how they feel about death since nobody who's alive actually knows what it feels like to physically die and pass on. It also can be caused by a fear of poor health. Some are terrified of what comes before their death, like the fear of dying is worse than death itself to them. Um, this could be tied to a specific illness, a pain, 
or even fear of what they perceive to be a loss of dignity that comes with a disease. Another is the fear of the unknown. And there are people who fear death simply because they don't know what comes after death. It's part of our nature as humans to want understanding of everything that surrounds us and to fear what we don't know is uh, not uncommon for people. For some people, not knowing for certain what comes after they die, that can be literally terrifying. I do believe that that actual fear drives many to God when a lot of other things failed to do that. If this fear... Uh, death anxiety is different from necrophobia, which is fear of the dead, fear of dying things. So that is a different fear than this one. And having anxiety about death is fairly normal as a human condition, according to medical experts. However, some people think about their own death or the process of dying with such intense fear and anxiety that it persists and interferes with their daily life. And these feelings stop them from conducting daily activities that are normal or even leaving their homes at times. It becomes so intense. And their fears center on things that can result in their death. They stop doing things like some will not even be in a car. I was in a really bad um, multi-car pileup in 2008. And it was, I, it was very hard for me to get back in a vehicle for a minute. Some fear contamination. They fear dangerous objects. They fear certain types of people. And these phobias can lead a person to isolation, to not having friendships. And it will even drive them away from their family. And phobias such as this are often triggered by a specific event in a person's past. Although many times the person doesn't even remember what that is. It, they're just triggered by something in their subconscious. Um, the particular triggers for death anxiety can include an early traumatic event related to dying, perceived almost dying. Some people think, oh, I'm about to die, let's say potential car accident but they don't die, but they thought they were going to die, or the death of a loved one, or watching um, someone die of a sustained long illness, or having become diagnosed themselves with a severe illness, which will likely result in death. A 2017 study suggests that older adults fear the dying process, while younger people more commonly fear death itself. And according to a 2012 study, women were more likely than men to fear death of loved ones and the consequences of their death. So it's more common in women. There are specific Bible verses that address the fear of death. Matthew 10, 28 says, And do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Psalm 23, 4 says, Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me, your rod and your staff. They comfort me. Revelation 21, 4 says, He will wipe every tear away from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more, for the former things have passed away. Hebrews 2, 15 says, And deliver all those who who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. Hebrews 2, 14 through 15, Since therefore the children share in the flesh and blood, he himself likewise in death, that is the devil, and will deliver all of those who through fear of death are subject to lifelong slavery. So that's the longer verse of that Hebrews 2, 14 through 15. Second Timothy 1, 7, For God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. John 5, 24 says, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, 
but has passed from death to life. And so all of us can have occasions when we fear death. It is sort of hardwired into our system to avoid dying. That isn't something that a natural person would want to try to come close to. And our culture is very effective in causing that fear of death or causing people to be very reckless towards death causing situations. So there's a lot of influence in our culture, wherever that is. Death was not N-O-T, capital N-O-T, an original part of God's plan for his creation. His creation did not start out with death as part of the plan. We were made and originally created to be living in paradise and in very um, full-time communion with God. And death was the consequence of man's choice to bring sin into the world. It is God's grace that we die because otherwise, after we chose sin, we would be trapped forever in sin, in a sinful world. We would be forever trapped in this experience of this just crazy world becoming increasingly worse. We would have no way out of it. So death that God allowed at that point is actually grace, that there is a way out of it. Otherwise, we'd be trapped in it forever because God is eternal and there is a forever plan, but he put a stop to it once man made this experience sinful, he stopped it. The Bible gives more understanding of death than just natural death, the kind that we think about. There's also death of a person's relationship with God called spiritual death. And those who die without repenting of and leaving sin enter into yet another kind of death called eternal death. So these three deaths are interrelated, the biological or natural death, spiritual death, and eternal death. Biological or natural death is the one that is most familiar to us. And this death is a temporary separation of the bond between a person's soul and their body, which causes the body to undergo corruption. Ecclesiastes 12, seven says, the dust returns to the earth as it was, and the spirit returns to God who gave it. So God had told Adam after he sinned, you will return to the ground for out of it you were taken, for you were dust and to dust you shall return, Genesis 3.19. But that death was not the end of the soul's existence. The soul is not destroyed at death. At death, the soul goes into the presence of its creator, who is God. And to understand what happens at that meeting, the other deaths become very important. The second dimension of death, spiritual death, relates to our disposition towards God. And those who are dead towards God while they live here on this earth, walk in trespasses and sins, which defines their actual spiritual death, Ephesians 2, 1. They choose rebellion against God, Ephesians 2, 2, by following the prince of the power of the air who entices and encourages sinners to become sons of disobedience. They are spiritually dead. They live out the desires of the body and the mind, Ephesians 2, 3, called the flesh so when people say i have this person who loves jesus and then this person who does this thing that's the flesh this is the spirit but the one you feed is the one who wins so if you continue to sin you are feeding the flesh man and that is the one that will take you into an eternity apart from god if you want the spirit man to grow and live, you cut this one off. You kill him, God says. Crucify the flesh. And that's the only way for the spirit man to get up and become who God created him to be. So when sin has control of our whole person, our body and our mind, as evidenced by our living according to our own desires, which could include pastoring a megachurch, growing a large ministry, 
all of these things can be done by the natural mind. And so just because you're religious does not mean that you are in the spirit man because many religious people are religious in the flesh. They are not following Jesus. They follow their own desires of wanting to be this pastor, wanting to grow the biggest ministry, wanting to have the largest numbers. So if those following you, if you are in ministry, you need to turn around, look at who's following you because that's how you know the fruit of whose you are. So if you turn around and the people that are following you in ministry or following your teaching, following your um, whoever you're leading, if they have not abandoned sin, denied self, and are alive to Christ and living according to the plans that Jesus has for them, serving others, exalting the name of Jesus only, not themselves, if that's if the people behind you are not doing that and they are having their best life, you are not a ministry that is directed by God, and many are not. They are directed by ambition, which is a very corrupt, sinful nature, but it's very prevalent in ministry these days. So the fruit of your ministry will tell you if your ministry is of God or of yourself. You just look at the people that follow you and that will tell you who is the head of your ministry. The third part of death in the Bible is eternal death. And this comes after the biological or natural death and the spiritual death. So natural death is not the end of our existence. As many think, when I die, that's the end. That is absolutely not even close to the truth. The soul is separated from the body and it goes immediately into the presence of God. And if that person dies without turning from sin, self-rule to Jesus Christ, then that person dies in a state of rebellion, hostility toward God, and no matter how religious they were, they will face eternity separated from God. And death will never change that reality. There is not one more chance to get it right. This person meets God as their enemy, deserving punishment. And the Bible uses the word death to describe that person's condition in eternity. In Revelation, John speaks of the second death, which has no power over true believers in Jesus Christ, but is the condition of unbelievers in eternity, Re Revelation 26. And shortly after this, John connects the second death with the lake of fire, the place of eternal torment, where the wicked go, those who rejected living for Jesus, and the devils. And in hell, those who refused to lay down their own life for Jesus here and bought the lie that they could live their best life, they will suffer the wrath of God in their whole person, both soul and body forever in a lake of fire that was not created for humans it was created for the devil but humans choose to go there by their own refusal to live for God in this life God punishing those who refused him does not change the heart as seen in Revelation 16 10 through 11 if a person enters into eternity as an enemy of God, nothing can be done. There is no second chance. There is no purgatory. Purgatory is nowhere in the Bible or anything like it. It is done. It is over at the point of death. And those who love sin hate God. I hear so often people who are living in sin, sexually active, um, living in hatred, unforgiveness, bitterness, they say, I love Jesus. Jesus knows I love him. The problem is, is that you are so incredibly deceived because in this committed, faithful relationship that God has called you to with his son, there is no option for you to live completely contrary to him, cheating on him, committing 
um, sins that he says absolutely cannot be sustained in this trusted, faithful relationship. You cannot love sin and love Jesus at the same time. Actually, the Bible calls you a liar. God's great love will not change his heart. He loves Jesus too much to treat the sacrifice he paid cheaply. So God judges fairly and he punishes those who reject living for Jesus. And since eternity is forever, the punishment is forever because not because of God's choice, but your choice to gamble with that choice. I don't want to serve Jesus in my life, so I'm going to get this right at the end, but you don't make that choice. God does. Jesus himself speaks of that punishment as eternal punishment, and it takes nothing. It's nothing to take chances with for people. I don't know why so many do, but they think for some reason they're going to get an opportunity at the end when almost hardly anyone has an opportunity to get right with God at, when they wait till the last minute. It would be very rare. Eternal death is the final death in the Bible, and it describes the eternal state of those who chose to keep sin, who died here before choosing to leave their life of sin. They kept their rights to sin even if it was just one. They kept their right to cheat on Jesus. It's a state of eternal punishment by a just God who clearly stated it over and over and over in the Bible. And he demanded that those who claim to be his will truly warn others that this is what he expects and this is what he demands for eternity in heaven. But sadly, few who claim to belong to him actually do this. They simply don't have a love for God in them for others, and they think they're fine. They think they're not one of those sinners, but they don't care about those sinners. They don't say anything to them. They think someone else is assigned that call. But we are all assigned that call. If you belong to Jesus and you truly love him, and you love what he loves most, and you love what Jesus laid his life down for, you will be warning people on a regular basis. That is not something you would keep quiet. You would not let your family member drive off a cliff without warning them if you saw that coming. So it's the same principle. If you really do believe that God means what he says, you will definitely warn those you love. But most care about their own life which is the opposite of what a Jesus follower is. We don't care about our own life because we've laid that down. We care about what matters to God. So if you're focused on caring about your own life, you're going to want to get something straightened out before you meet Jesus because you don't match what's called um, what heaven requires either. You cannot be going to heaven and ignoring all of those around you who are at risk of eternity in hell. You cannot say you love Jesus and ignore that. Hebrews tells us that it is appointed for man to die once. Hebrews 9.27. So every single one of us will die. No one will escape death. And God has said clearly, all people are going to die. That truth is fixed and it is not changeable. God has also written the exact day and time of each person's life's end. He, he already knows when it is. And David says to God that in your book were written, every one of them, the days that were formed for me. Psalm 139, 16. Every one of our days from the first to the last has been eternally appointed by God. And for that reason, our life and death are entirely subject to the will of God. And James tells us, come now you who say, today or tomorrow we will go into such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and make a profit, yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. James 4, 13 through 15. And James' point is clear, life is very short and we don't have control of it. 
We have no ultimate say over the length of our days, whether we will be alive tomorrow or not. We have no idea. And money, I don't care how much money or how much of the world you own, has absolutely no power over that choice. One example of that would be Steve Jobs from Apple, absolute genius. Certainly had no limit of money, but yet he died at 56 years old of cancer. He could have bought any remedy that there was, and I understand he traveled all over the world looking for that remedy, but he could not buy one more day of his life, and it was a really, probably a terrible, painful end for him. 56 years old, incredibly accomplished, very, very wealthy, and he would have traded probably everything at that moment to get more time. But no amount of money could change that. The end of our days is set by the Lord, and they are so valuable. Every single hour is so valuable, and many would pay any amount to have one more hour when most people are wasting that amount of time on a regular basis. They waste and waste and waste their time when others who have all the means to buy that time cannot. We need to live mindful of that reality that we are not owed one more minute on this earth. And at any point in time, and it happens to many every day, that it's over. Instantly it's over. No chance to turn around and say, I needed five more minutes. The rich fool of Jesus' parable is a fool because he lives as though he has many days to pursue his selfish pleasure. But God said to him, fool, this night your soul is required of you in Luke 12, 20. The wise person is the one who knows that the length of his days is set by God and he lives around that reality. He doesn't waste his life. He doesn't consider that he's got all these years ahead or the insanity of people to sit here and plan for the rapture is craziness because I think, how do you think you'll even be here tomorrow? Like, what makes you think you're going to even be alive at that point? Even if it's a week from now. And then the fact that people just coast along waiting for this resolution of their own time. But there's people dying around us like crazy. We get more notifications of people we know dying at this point in time than I've ever experienced in my life. And this is why Moses taught us to pray in Psalm 90, 12, teach us to number our days. Every one of our days from first to last has been eternally appointed by God and is entirely subject to his will. And you should not once take five minutes for granted. We need to remember that we are God's creation. He made us. We did not make ourselves as much as people think they created their own children. God already created us. He has full rights to do with us as he pleases. Romans 9.20 And if he made us for the sole purpose of having a loving family, that is his right as a creator to decide how that goes. If we ourselves created well, just people, for example, having children, they feel like they have rights to say, my child is going to be in hockey, my child is going to be a cheerleader. So human beings by the same nature feel like they're entitled to complete rights of what they create, but for some reason we think God is not fair. However, God created everything and he can determine every single way it goes because he's the one who had the plan in the beginning. He chose men and women to be his family, not angels. Adam was created without sin. So in the beginning, this whole plan was created without sin and without death. And we cannot blame God for all of this death because he didn't create this plan to include that. And because we have all gone the same way as Adam, we cannot really blame Adam like people like to do. They think Adam brought sin into the world, but given the opportunity, every single one of us did the same thing. So if we would have been there, we would have done that too, because we did now. We already know that Adam sinned and we could choose not to, but we still choose to sin. 
So everybody has their fair share of blame there. We do what we want instead of sitting with God from the understanding that we have of God, at whatever point we understand that there is a God, we have the option to go sit with God and ask him what to do with each of our days. That's how it was supposed to go. How many people actually do that? So there's nothing unfair about how God decides at the end who's going to stay with him and who isn't. There is nothing unfair about that. He is so clear in how he wrote this story. The problem is most people don't want to know the truth. They often say, well, how do you know the Bible is real? How do you know it's true? I already know they don't want to know the truth. Anybody who would say that simply doesn't want to know the truth. But God gets to decide what happens with each one of us because he's the one who wrote the story. And those who won't choose him, who won't use this life to bless him, honor him, and be his family, they certainly should not expect to have him there. Everyone makes a choice for themselves when they're alive with the amount of time that they have here. Everyone gets to choose. I'm going to love God. I'm going to walk with God. I'm going to belong to him. I'm going to do everything I can to live out my life the way he wants me to. Or they can say, I believe in God. I believe in Jesus. I prayed some kind of prayer, but I'm going to do this and that and then do this and that and go find this person and then marry that person and do this and do this other thing. So everyone gets to make a choice who they live for, self or God, this side of heaven. Every single person gets to make that choice. And then you face what that means on the other side. When you pass through the veil, through death, then you get what you chose. I don't know why people blame God for that, but you choose and then you get the outcome of that. So if you ignore God here, except for when you need something from him, you should not feel entitled to living with him forever on the other side. You should understand that if you ignored him here, you don't get the privilege of being with him when you get there. God's intentions in the garden were only good. God placed Adam in paradise, surrounded him with endless blessing. Adam was created to fellowship with God as a full-time forever plan. God would come very near to him. He would speak to him. He was very present in his life. Then God told Adam, if you do this, you lose this all. You lose everything if you do this one thing. Do not eat fruit from this one single tree. There's this entire vast garden full of trees that you can have, but don't touch that tree. So with a little help from Eve, Adam ends up doing the very thing God told him would cost him everything. And if Adam had simply obeyed God and stayed away from that one tree, all of humanity would have benefited from his obedience, living forever in an amazing life with God. That's how it was supposed to go. The whole story was full of generosity and kindness. It was a story of a loving and a caring God there was no death, no sin, no pain, no anger. It was a beautiful story. That's how God wrote it. But we can't fault Adam. We can't fault our parents. Because every day, almost every human is given an opportunity to show whether they love God or whether they prefer to sin. Every single day, sometimes many times a day. And we can't just turn to Adam and blame that failure on him because he has nothing to do with the choices that we make in our life today. We curse our own life. Jesus, the only Son of God, he made himself a human. He came and he turned this story that had gotten all messed up, he turned it back and he made it right again. 
He came down to earth as a human, his creation. He came that low. The maker became the, the thing that he makes so that he could turn it around and get it right for those of us who he still loved and still wanted. Everyone had another chance to get this right. He set the story straight. He turned the curse back around. He gave us a new reality so that we could walk in the original plan, which was paradise forever with God. Jesus himself came. He stood in our place. He took our punishment before God. His life was a life of perfect obedience. His sacrificial death for sin was for those of us who would choose him. The very moment we put our trust in him, that death covers our sin. And this transfer of righteousness is a free gift of God. There is not one thing that we deserve about it. None of us deserve one good thing from God. But God treats us the same way he treats his son Jesus, the most precious thing he has. Because of Jesus, he now treats us like we are the most important one to him. Because of our sin, Jesus was treated as a sinner. But because of Jesus' obedience, we are treated as righteous and looked upon as Jesus. We get the life, the glory, and the eternity that Jesus earned for us by dying at the hands of his own creation. And there is nothing fair about any of this. So when people think it's unfair how God is, absolutely unfair. The most unfair part of this whole story is how unfair it was to Jesus. Our life and destiny are not earned by anything that we have done, are doing, or ever will do. It's all filthy to God unless... It's done with and for Jesus as an act of worship. Anything else is filthy to him. Our freedom has been completely earned by the work of Jesus Christ. Not one thing about us. I don't care how powerful you think you are in ministry. It's filthy to God. Only Jesus is precious to God. And God the Father accepted the sacrifice that Jesus made. And our only hope of any kind of favor with him is to walk in that sacrifice. And in that case, he takes unspeakable delight in us. It is graciously given to all who come to Christ. Even to be able to receive the work of salvation is an incredible gift because we are not capable of even receiving it except for a miracle of God. Salvation is all of grace from start to finish, nothing we can do. It's all a gift. No one can boast in the presence of God. The one who understands his sins, who understands what Christ has done for us to be able to abandon those, they understand there is no room for merit on our part. Now back to the subject of death. So death is a certainty. Death should also inspire fear and dread in the hearts of human beings who are definitely not ready to meet God. They should be afraid of death. Death is a fearful thing in itself, especially to those who are estranged from God, who have chosen not to be reconciled to him because they hang on to self-will, self-life, self-desires, even low self-esteem, anything about self stands in the way of God. Hebrews speaks of the fear that death brings to human beings. It says sinners are held in lifelong slavery because of the fear of death, Hebrews 2.14. Satan holds the power of death as he tempts people to sin. He accuses us of all of our sins, and he acts as though he actually has power over death. So those who are still in sin are powerless to free themselves from the bondage to the fear of death and from the grip of the power of death. So when people call and they're terrified of death, everything depends on what have you done about Jesus? If you have laid down your self-life for Jesus, you have absolutely no reason to fear death. Death is the ultimate gain for you. 
if you don't understand the truth, it's very clear in the Bible. You just need to come to an understanding of the truth. But for those who have not been born again and laid down all rights to their own life, they should definitely fear death. The bondage of fear of death can only be broken in one way, and that is through death of the Son of God. He died for us. Now we will lay down our life for him. And no one ever returns from death to life. Death ends our present form of existence here on this earth. The lives we live here will be over. And the gospel tells us that Jesus conquered that death. That is the only way that we can face death with any hope or confidence is Jesus. We each have to face what we will choose about death before death, however, to this life. Whatever we choose is what we will get for all of eternity. And death is truly fearful because it is going to be punishment for sin to a good many who chose to keep sin. Death is never good for that group. It's always going to be bad. If we love God and others, and others, every single person who qualifies as other, Jesus gave up his life for. They're very significant to Jesus. We must encourage people to think about God, eternity, and making that final choice today, because today is the only chance you have to get it right, because tomorrow is not promised. Are we ready to share the hope of this message with someone whose life is turned upside down, whether they're fearing death, they've gotten their own bad news, they're, as we know, so many trapped in addiction, sudden death every single day for many. If we are prepared to help them understand this point and point them to Jesus, the one who conquered death for them, then when they die, they will simply pass through a veil. The gospel completely changes our anticipation and experience of death. The when and how of our deaths remain unknown to us, but we know that when that happens, we are going to pass through a veil into the presence of the one that we love the most. Our Father, who wants nothing for us but what is for our everlasting, forever good, the one who has pre-written all the details in this great love story that he's been writing since the beginning of time. He's the one we're going to meet on the other side. Death is loss to us here, but it is a greater gain. So when we lose someone, even a pet is so overwhelming. It is a definite loss on this side, but it will be an incredible gain in eternity if you make the right choice to join those you have lost who have also chosen Christ. Death ushers us into the riches of heaven and forever our inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, according to 1 Peter 1, 4, an inheritance that God has kept in heaven for us and for which God is keeping us through faith. And when death brings us into the presence of God, we approach one who is our friend, one who welcomes us with open arms, one who delights in our presence with him. The God whom we know and love here on earth is the God whose presence we will now fully enjoy in heaven forever. In fellowship with God, there is no death. It is only life. And overcoming the fear of death is about absolutely knowing the truth because for the one who is in Christ, there is no death. It's an absolute translation into a glorious eternity. But for overcoming a fear of death, there are practical steps. Many people believe they shouldn't die because they have too much to live for. And if that is a business or something about children or other dependents, you need to consider ahead of time, just make plans for their care so that you aren't living in this constant if I were to die, there's going to be this horrendous mess for people. You can take care of that now. Decide who will take over these different roles that you think only you can fill. And come up with plans. If this is something that torments you, make a plan so that <clears throat> your family won't be caught in a lurch if there's all kinds of left mess for them. Look into a will. 
make sure that your life is organized, that paperwork is organized, because most of us have seen what happens when it isn't. There's so many family fights. There are so many problems when everything is left not clear. Reconcile broken relationships before you don't have the chance anymore. But don't live for dying. There is a difference between, between taking reasonable steps to prepare and obsessing about death. Do not do that. Overcome the fear of death by the strong feelings about what you are concerned about happening to you. There are people people who get some pretty serious diagnoses, don't let that incapacitate you. There is a grace of God, I've heard it from many, that comes into play for his own at that time. So when we naturally fear, because this is our thought about what this certain kind of thing is going to do, there is such an amazing grace that is apparent for those who are in Christ. And then when you cross through that veil, there is no memory of what was here. It's entirely possible that during the course of an illness or injury that you could lose control over most situations in your life. You may not be able to make your wishes known. So the wise thing to do is to get the things that are most important to you done prior to that point. Just write things down. Make sure someone knows where it is. Um, you're not being morbid to make proper planning. The spiritual steps to overcoming the fear of death in the middle of living life with people in this world, it's difficult to keep in mind that this life is incredibly temporary and it's very, very short. And it's not always a great experience for many people. And we're not guaranteed that it is. I mean, Christians, believers are guaranteed suffering. First John 2, 15 through 17 says, Do not love the world or things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the boast boastful pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. The world is passing away and also its lusts, but the one who does the will of God will live forever. And how we remember this is by abiding, 1 John 2, 24, by staying in the truth of God's word, believing what he says about us and the world around us. That will give us proper perspective regarding this life and the one that we are going to choose one way or the other that is coming that is eternal. And when we're able to keep that kingdom perspective, then we're able to fulfill 1 John 3, 1 through 2 that says, See how great a love the Father has bestowed on us, that we would be called children of God, and such we are. For this reason the world does not know us, because it did not know Him. Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not appeared as yet what we will be. We know that when He appears, we will be like Him, because we will see Him just as He is. And it is also evident that we do not belong in this world because those of us who have truly chosen to be in Christ, we, we recognize that this is definitely not the one that we want to make the end game or the main game because this one is a vapor. It is very temporary and we need to rescue as many as we can into heaven so that they don't spend eternity in hell. And I know people don't like to hear that. I've had six phone calls in the last two days chewing me out for saying people will go to hell. Sadly, the Bible confirms that, that most people will choose to go to hell over following Jesus the way that we are required to make heaven. So we have to take ownership of our position we have to realize that the choice that we're making is not God sending us to hell. It is us choosing to abandon Christ and then thinking and feeling entitled to heaven for some reason. We are not. The Creator makes the decisions based on how we treated Him. 
So as children of God, we need to understand that every five minutes we have is a gift. Well, it's a gift for those who aren't children of God too. Everyone should be using their time because time is the true currency. Time is the ultimate currency. And that's the one you really want to invest well. And just to add for the the people who are dealing with this incredible fear, first of all, discipleship is not being done well anywhere. It's hardly anywhere. When people have to reach out to us and say, where can we get discipleship when this city is full of churches? That's incredibly sad when we can't even think of a place to send them. Discipleship will give you the ability to not fear, not just death, but other things too, because it gives you an understanding of the Bible and the truth in it, and it will free you from fear because you will know God. So discipleship is the true solution to not living in fear if you are a believer. Um, we do prayer ministry as a pretty regular um, part of our ministry, and so we understand that to have your body responding to fear in a way that results in you ending up in the hospital is a pretty strong agreement with fear, and that agreement allows the devil to just pound you with fear. You may not even have thoughts around it, just it allows him to pound you with fear. So if you do have that, we invite you to reach out to us to call us because we'd be more than happy to help you break agreements with whatever it is that is given the enemy the right to just torment you not just with fear of death but any fear we would be privileged to help you so just know that it isn't as it, it is as simple but it isn't as simple as just understanding your position in christ if there is something that is causing you to not be able to get free of that fear and you simply don't know where to start, by all means, we would love to help you. That would be our way to serve Jesus in you. So feel free to reach out to us if that is ever the case. So we do understand what it's like to end up trapped in things. So we have learned well how to get ourselves out. So I pray that everyone who, first of all, is not ready to meet God right now, we know that we are living in the most precarious days so far. Even now, just today, over by Turkey, a sudden earthquake, 4,000 people already that have lost their lives in a sudden event. We know that these things happen all over. God, we are completely taking things for granted if we aren't living ready for that moment because many do take that for granted. I was one and I will never do that again. So I ask you that you just jolt all of us into the reality that we are not owed one more second, that our chance to choose you is right now. And if we don't, we don't, we are not owed another chance because if we don't do it in this one, we said no. So I pray that you bring heavy conviction to those who are gambling with eternity. And I pray for those who aren't sure that you would cause them to reach out to us or someone else to make sure that they are ready to meet Jesus. Heaven and hell are forever. It is not something you wanna loosely prepare for. Thank you that you have given us the truth, that the whole world has been given the word to be able to know the truth if you truly wanna know it. You can find a Bible. You can download it on your phone. It is readily available that you would help people to seek you, that they would do nothing else. Nothing else is more important than seeking you. I ask that you help us, Jesus, to be the greatest examples 
for you that we can possibly be, that we would never shame you this side of heaven, that we would be completely faithful and passionate for what is important to you, and that is the lost. So we thank you, God, for continuing to make a way for us and for helping us to be bold in our sharing of the true gospel of Jesus Christ. I ask this all in your precious name, Jesus. Amen.